uh, before the break, if you were in here, about the dangers of Web 2.0. So hopefully we have a little bit on how to uh, make it a little bit safer, at least for the applications you're responsible for. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Anke Schulman, CEO for Imperva. And uh, yes, I'm going to talk about JavaScript hijacking and cross site request forgery uh, because this is what everybody is talking about these days. This is the next uh, big threat to uh, web applications today. And while uh, we've seen the previous presentation about uh, certain ways to mitigate those attacks, and certainly a lot of people are discussing how to mitigate those attacks using code based uh, solutions. I'm going to talk about gateway based solutions. We've seen the structure of the very presentation, but we think one step further. So we're going to talk about detecting and mitigating JavaScript hijacking and then process request for it, and a little bit about trying to detect fraud attempts that exploits process request for the end of the final. So why am I going to talk about it? Well, for first thing, JavaScript hijacking is a very web 2.0 specific attack. It's very related to address applications, so applications that use JavaScript, JSON as their way to convey data rather than just convey the application logic. Cross-site request forgery, well, it has been given a lot of attention and, and experts predict that this is becoming the major issue in web security these days. And this is somewhat related to web 2.0 applications because those applications tend to break into smaller modules with very simple interfaces, stateless modules that you know are sequenced one after the other, doing very specific functionality, very easy to uh, invoke. And then, of course, I'm going to talk about gateway-based solution because I'm a WAF vendor, and code-based solutions do not apply to me. So, but but really, I think that the traditional mitigation techniques, those that are code-based and I'm going to talk about them, are, are not suitable and not cost-effective in web environments. And this is a strong statement, but I'm going to discuss it more detail. And as a consequence, businesses today are not properly protected against this type of web fraud. So what is JavaScript hijacking? It was introduced by Fortified, uh, by Fortified this year. And uh, it is specific to applications that use JavaScript for data rather than justification logic. And it abuses a loophole in the browser's same origin policy. That policy that was introduced in the previous session. A script from any domain can be included and executed in the context of another website. So I can embed in my HTML form a script from a different domain. Again, this is code reuse and all this stuff. But in reality, what it means is that everything within that script is accessible to my code. And if this script happens to contain an area with sensitive information, then that area of sensitive information is accessible to scripts from my and I'm going to demonstrate in a second, but I think that the most notable example of this type of vulnerability was the, the, the Gmail contact list. Again, before going to demo, this is how it works. We have a legitimate user connecting to an application, logging into the application, doing whatever he wants to do, retrieving information and so on. That application uses JavaScript to convey data back to the browser. For some reason, and we're going to see that soon, that user from that same browser is accessing an attacker control page. And the code in this page includes a script and here that takes the browser back to the back side retrieves the information, and because the information is part of a script element within the HTML form, 
it can be conveyed back to the attacker's control plane. So let's see how it works in reality. We have a simple bank sign here. It's not very fancy. It's for me. So I'm going to log into the bank application. And once I log in, you can see that I have my balance display. I'm using the DWR framework behind the scenes. And I'm using an old version of this framework, because the newer one uh, is a immune against this type of attacks. So I'm using an address application here to read the balance. Just as you know, I can transfer funds from my account. So I can choose transfer funds to transfer thousand dollars and you can see that my balance has changed. Now that's all nice and dandy. It so happens that I'm using the same browser, which is what most of us do, to access other sites. This is my personal information portal. I have here my Gmail, my favorite weather and sites and, and everything else and I have here banners delivered by, I don't know, but they are just delivered here. And well, if someone says, click me to win a million dollars, I would probably do so. What I don't know is that someone has already prepared a server somewhere in the internet with the proper code So, well, yeah, just won a million dollars, and someone else got my balance. You go back into Spain, you probably see what happened here. So, here is the code for this attack, and there was a question in the previous session. How do I take back the information in, in a cross-site request forgery attack? So this is a cross-site request forgery attack in which I can grab the information back. You see here a script element with the get balance URL. And above it, we can see the script that actually takes the result and send them back to the attacker's control site because the information is delivered as a JavaScript array. Okay. So, what are we going to do against it? Very simple, we just heard the solution. You need a session on a random token and you should track it. You generate a random session token for each new session. You include this random number in each form or link, and then validate that random number for each incoming form link against your, your session pool, session dictionary. And of course, you reject requests with invalid random. There, there's another suggestion. Uh, against this type of attack. And it's changing the response format. But if the response is not pure JavaScript, then the attack will not work. So that's, that's another type of solution. But if you look at these solutions, they require that we recode application. And that's a little bit what about those third-party components? I cannot change the code of third-party components that I'm using in my application. What about all those applications that are already deployed in my enterprise? I cannot just go and modify them. It's expensive. It interrupts ongoing functionality. I don't always have the knowledge to do that. 
going to have programmers to do. And then, of course, there's the issue of coding practices. We, we have seen the, the cross-site request forgery test tool in, in the previous session, and I was giving a webinar this morning with some of our class, and we were talking about their use of the firewall to mitigate this type of problem. He said, I don't need to test my application for cross-site request forgery on other pieces. I know that I have cross-site request forgery on other pieces in my application, I will know, I know that I will always have them. It is very, very hard to clean all instances of cross-site request forgery from your application. It is very difficult to make sure that each and every piece of new functionality going into the application will not have cross-site request forgery vulnerability. So, you can never cover each and every line of code in your application. And, and in the previous session, this was one of the conclusions. You should decide what is the code that you want to concentrate on and you know just forget about the rest. And as an application owner, I don't want to forget about the rest. I want to be covered with all my applications, with all the functionality. And, of course, there are some other shortcomings to, to this approach, which is that uh, there is no feature for that. Remember, in cross-site request forgery attacks, the request is generated by the victim. Unlike SQL injection, where you have the attacker on the other side of the connection, you should be able give some feedback to the victim that is accessing the wrong side, that is going to bad places, that someone is trying to trick him into executing action against the man. This, remember, this is not an attack against the application. This is an attack against the victim, the user of the application. So I would like to give some feedback on it. And of course, in web 2.0 environment, there is this issue of meshups, where the browser combines information from various domains into a single application on the desktop. And in this environment, sometimes the request generated by the meshup looks very much like it is the result of a cross-site request for transaction. So I cannot be decisive about whether this is actually cross-site request for or not. So if code-based solutions are not the answer, what is the answer? And I say that let's take a look at gateway-based solutions. It doesn't require code changes, because I have a gateway in front of my applications and, and that case we, we do everything that is required and if somehow be able to get a solution on the gateway. It can be used for third party components, it could be used for already deployed applications. It does not disrupt application availability, there is no need for redeployment and it protects all instances of JavaScript hybrid and vulnerabilities within the application and within different applications. I don't have to choose. I may want to choose, but I don't have to choose. I can say, well, protect everything. Okay. And then it gives me continuous protection and protection regardless of new vulnerabilities introduced into existing applications by a programmer writing new code. And I claim that we could come up with a solution that provides detection, but as well, feedback. How do we do it? So let's look at some observations. And I know that some purists would say that this is not entirely true for all cases and environments. But we're living in a practical world looking for practical solutions. 
And, and those solutions are the ones that apply to most environments and most users. So the first observation is that the malicious request is sent from the victim's browser. And the second one is that a cross-site request forgery attempt would always be part of an authenticated session. It wouldn't make sense any way, any other way. Unlike, you know, a shortcut or, or a simple link between applications, a request that, that might be cross-site must be part of an authenticated session. Otherwise, there's no sense to it. The request is invoked by a visit to an attacker's control page outside of that domain. <coughs> so it will have a referrer value that is not part of the target application. And of course, the response in the case of JavaScript hijacking is JavaScript, which is very important. Remember, JavaScript hijacking is about taking the response, and the response must be JavaScript format. And until that moment that a response has been delivered and interpreted by the browser, I'm still saying. So I'm going to build a two-step solution. The first step would be to detect this, and the second step, because I have to be decisive about whether this is an attack attempt or the use of Mesha, a legitimate use of Mesha, I'm going to interact with the end user to resolve the event. So detection is relatively easy. The request must be part of an authenticated session, which is something that gateways today can easily recognize. And then the domain value in the referral field header is not part of the application. This can be easily determined either by manual setup or a dynamically profile behavior. Again, gateways can do that today. And of course, response is JavaScript. So once a gateway has detected this, situa this situation, the next step would be to interact with the user. And interaction with the user here is very easy. I just have to prefix the JavaScript code with my code. Remember, the assumption about JavaScript hijacking is that the response is JavaScript. So I take this script and prefix it with my script that generates an alert box and includes information about the original, the, the origin of the request. The end user can approve or disapprove. So the end user can say, well, this is a part of a legitimate measure that I have created, or I don't know this domain, I don't know where it came from. So let's do a quick demo, and I've created a proof of concept. Gateway here. I'm going back to the bank account, logging in, and now let's go back to my portal. And this is how it looks. So the gateway just takes the response and respects it with a very short JavaScript code that generates this element. Now, if I click OK button, execution of the script continues as normal. And the content, or the JavaScript array that was part of the original response, is available to the application code of the browser. If I choose cancel, then the code generates an exception and the execution of the script stops, which means that the data is not available to the script to take it back to the attacker's control side. 
Remember, this happens on my browser. So as long as the information does not leave my browser, I'm okay. So of course I'm going to choose cancel and execution proceeds seamlessly regular, but the script that takes the information and grabs it to the user does not work. Yeah. So if you clicked OK, is it going to make another HTTP request back to... No, no, it doesn't have to. The execution of the script, the original script continues. But if it was server code that it was trying to access, like if you were trying to... The scenario is that we have a request that is expected to give back a script. I take the script and just add some code before it starts to execute. So nothing is broken if I choose OK. I have a, one of the first things that I tell people to do is to turn off refer. Would this then cause problems for people who have disabled the refer field and they go to a legitimate bank and say transfer funds? Would it be doing this for them as well? Well, you could compare this to uh, regard empty refer as a problem and then request confirmation. Okay? But it would cause a problem and we'll have to discuss another type of solution that would solve this problem for those users who disable refer. Which which you know, there is a reason to do that, there is a reason why not. You know, it's an issue of consultant preferences. So why, why can't the attacker just override the confirm function and make it always return yes, return true? Because the confirm function is part of the script that I'm generating. No, but the attacker is sourcing the script into this page. You can say window.confirm the important function and always return true. You do this before you have the script. No, this, there, there is nothing that runs before the script. I, I understand your question, but there's, there's a way around it as well. Yeah, I, I understand the question, there's a way around it. But I, I can make sure, I can always make sure that, that this code runs first and that, that it cannot be overridden. We So we can take this a little bit further and you know inject a more complex code that provides a richer set of user decisions. For example, always block for the specific domain. Always allow the specific domain. Never bother me again. I don't know what, but, but we can have a whole set of behaviors using this very simple JavaScript code and all these functionalities actually implemented by, can be implemented by cookies generated at client side. So really there is no server side code involved in this. It's just the code looking into the cookies and saying, well, this domain is safe for this user, this domain is always unsafe for this user, this is undecided, let's ask the user again. This user is crazy, doesn't want any others. I can take it even further because the injected code can be enhanced to report the decisions back to the gateway. And once I do that, I can enhance the behavior and the decisions made by the gateway according to this information and even detect fraud. Because you know, it's usually not a targeted attack for a specific victim. You would usually send tons of emails or, or you know, buy your banner with, with some uh, syndication engine and, and have displayed for millions of users until you get your victim. So this is not a targeted, a victim targeted attack. It's a site targeted attack. So if I'm starting to see a negative decision from a number of users, I can start making automated decisions. 
or I could at least change it, the color of the alert box. Say, well, you're not the first one to tackle this and the other is denied. Okay. So I can have a bigger picture here, not only a single user uh, view of the problem. Once we've looked at the JavaScript hijacking, the next step is to go and look into process request for here. It used in, in, in the past session and it abuses the trust of the server in the client. Uh, it takes advantage of the stateless uh, nature of requests and can invoke any functionality. The difference between cross-site request for the discussed in the previous session and JavaScript hijacking is that I must be able to stop the request. I cannot wait for the response. If I wait for the response, it's too late. So I have to make my decision upon the request. Okay, just again, see the scenario? Once I get back the HTML form with an image taking me back to the back application, it's over. The request goes, there's no value for the response. And we go back to our banking application. other banner here, everything looks fine, but going back into the bank side, I see that someone is paying for ten dollars out of my account. This course has to pay for the very simple. So in theory, I could go back and recode my applications, adding this random number, random token that we discussed earlier, and be done with it. Or I could introduce a CAPTCHA or additional authentication for each and every function in my system. But, you know, it can't be done in practice. You can do it for part of it. You can choose your, your most sensitive part of the application and, and do it. But you want to protect the entire application. And as mentioned earlier, if you re-authenticate for each and every action in your application, it becomes a nuisance. It's not always possible to introduce this extra authentication or capture without really recoding the entire application especially with web view applications, where most of the requests are going through HTML HTTP and are not just rendered by the browser. So again, let's look at gateway visualization. <coughs> I look at the request, it should be part of an authenticated session, otherwise it doesn't make sense, and the referrer is again outside of the application domain. However, the interaction with the user must occur before the request is conveyed to the server. And I cannot just inject code into the response because I cannot make any assumptions regarding the structure of the response and the way it is going to be rendered by the browser. So I need a different mechanism. And, well, I call this mechanism a security monitor. And it's JavaScript code that is running on the client side on behalf of the security gateway. It is initialized when a browser forms the authenticated session. So I have to inject it once into the browser 
when the session is authenticated, I can do it using Gate through that. And it's constantly waiting for commands from the gateway. There are a number of methods to do that using JavaScript, you can either use XML the web, you can use refresh, there are a bunch of methods to do that. And then of course, each of these code will have its own nonce, its own random token coded into it. When the services, the gateway suspects a process of web forgery that it flags the session and sends an HTTP <coughs> with the original URL. And this actually causes the browser to constantly resend this send request, regardless if this is again or post. So the browser as part of its normal behavior, will resend the request until there is a resolution from the security monitor. Okay. There, there, there are alternatives. You do want to store requests internally and so on, but using 307, we can make this happen. And then, on the other channel, I'm responding to the security monitor with a code that either displays a captcha or you know just asks for acknowledgement like the way we saw it earlier. The user choice is communicated back to the server. We have to communicate back to the gateway. And if the user approves, then the gateway releases the session and next time the request is sent by the browser it just goes in. Of course, if the user declines, we send a 403 back to the browser. Just go back and see a quick demo of this. I have here the gateway running new mode notice now that when I'm authenticated in the application I get this message saying proceed to account page which means that the security monitor is now opening on my computer and if I then go to portal try to do the same stuff this time it's the security monitor that pops up this window requests from the browser, keep going to the server. You can see it here probably. Okay, you can see the server resending and resending the same request. And I can now make the decision to make it go and it can stop. And if I go back here, the balance is not changed. So I've managed to get the user approval before of course, this same technique can be extended to have a richer choice of user actions and uh, I can further extend it to detect fraud attempts across a number of victims. Uh, There's an issue that should be discussed regarding this just go briefly on it, that it creates a heavy burden on the gateway. But for each user session, I actually open 
another connection which is constantly nagging the gateway. So you'll have to find a more the security monitor and indeed we have experimented with a lightweight TCP stack that supported it. But you know in an overwhelming portion of the sessions the security monitor is never used. And then when on those sessions that it is actually used, it's used in an extremely small portion of the time. So most of the time, I don't have to maintain the entire TCP stack with all the structures and the buffers to support it. And then another observation is because I control the security monitor and I know what are the expected requests and commands if I send that, I can make sure that those fit into a single network frame. So I don't have to maintain all this sequencing and, and reordering logic for TCP. So basically, we have able to create a like with TCP stack uh, that, that supports a huge number of security monitors without really having to uh, maintain TCP sockets for each of them. And here's a twist in the plot. We've talked about gateway solutions that take a different approach from code based solutions. Known for a random token. But some people would insist on this type of solution, of having a non interactive, foolproof solution that tracks a non and the question is, why not use the gateway to generate the correct nodes? We have seen in the previous session the start of it, where you have taken an external component and put it on top of your application and introduced automatically these nodes into the request and response. And you can do the same thing using a network gateway. Now you would say it requires understanding of the HTML, and worse than that, if you are using Web2 applications, it would probably require you to understand the application logic written in JavaScript. But in reality, most Ajax applications, whether they use third-party frameworks or homegrown in-house developed infrastructure, have the request generation code concentrated in a very specific area of the JavaScript code. This could be a single file, this could be a distinctive piece of code within each response. So it is very easy to inject the token generation code into this JavaScript piece once per session. And from that moment on, each request generated in the browser that goes through the engine will have the request time to it. And if I do have one more minute, I can actually demonstrate that. Again, we are using the DWR framework here. So, back into my band. Going to authentication. and take a look at the requests and responses generated right now, and I have the Paris proxy open here, we will see 
And we have altered the request for engine JS, which is a piece of code in DWR framework that contains the request generation engine. And all we have to do is go to this location in the code and add this simple piece of code introducing a randomly generated token into the request generation engine. And from that moment on, everything is done with that. I don't have to care about all the other requests. I just check. And we have checked this, and it works perfectly with prototype and, and Google Web Toolkit and practically almost every Ajax framework that you have out there. So, what's my take on this? My take on this is that we have to discuss the object hijacking and cross our request ordering because they are here and they are a real threat application. And my take on this is that code based solutions should be exercised, especially for those very sensitive parts of the application. You shouldn't leave vulnerabilities that you know of open. that combines detection with end user confirmation. It is cost effective. It allows convenient and fast integration into your existing deployed applications and into applications using third party components. This thing I think that you can't do with recoding. It provides continuous protection. Even if you introduce new vulnerabilities, into your application, you are still protected. And an additional bonus is that it can be extended if you detect large scale fraud, not the specific cross site request for the attempt against 